Chag Simchat Torah Sameach. Today we're celebrating Simchat Torah, rejoicing over the giving of the Torah. In Tehillim 84, we read, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! I long, I yearn for the courts of Hashem. My body and soul shout for joy to the living God. Blessed is the one who finds refuge in you. The pilgrim's ways are in his heart, passing through the valley of Bacha, <clears throat> a place of weeping. They make it a place of springs, as if the early rain had covered it with blessings. They go from strength to strength, appearing before God in Zion. Better one day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be lying upon the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is sun and shield. Hashem bestows grace and glory. He does not withhold his bounty from those who walk righteously. The High Holy Days are a time of Aliyah. Aliyah is a word that literally means to go up. But this word is also used to refer to those who, who return to Aretz or who make pilgrimages to Yerushalayim or to Israel. In the days of the first and second temples, such pilgrimages formed the framework of our lives as we were commanded to appear before Adonai three times each year. And so Aliyah for us can be our participation in these Aliyah festivals. But Aliyah can also represent our commitment to spiritual aspirations, which allow us to grow and develop and mature, to transcend the merely physical nature of our world. In the past, God commanded us to go up to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Sukkot. This journey might have taken place before Rosh Hashanah so that we might hear for ourselves the blowing of the shofar out, calling us to attention and experience Yom Kippur at the Mikdash of God. But for nearly 2,000 years, we have had no temple. And for nearly that long, we have been wanderers throughout the world with no homeland of our own. God has been our sanctuary, as he promised in the Torah. And our pilgrimage has been in mind rather than in place. As we recall the way in which God has led us, we think of the days and years of our pilgrimage, the character of our Aliyah, our life here and now. We're reminded, as we were at the beginning of Sukkot, that He is our sanctuary, our dwelling place. Where does Hashem dwell? The first dwelling place of God with man was the wilderness Mishkan. It was built precisely according to God's perfect plan. Using materials he provided to our people through the Egyptians and with the skills he had given us to create, beautify, and adorn it. When it was completed, 
God's presence filled it so entirely that even Moshe was unable to enter. The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire leading and guiding our people were the visible signs of God's presence with the people of Israel. God ministered to our people from his Mishkan. The Jerusalem Hamikdash Hagadol, the great temple of Shlomo's construction, was built with the most exquisite materials, the best, and in such a way that even the noise of the building was not actually heard on the site. Beauty, serenity, and a sense of peace pervaded the Mikdash. When it was dedicated, the presence of God entered the Holy of Holies. God's presence was literally resident in the temple in a way which man had not experienced before nor since. Before the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BCE, God's presence departed from it. We have a description of this. It left by the eastern gate of the temple and it did not return to the post-exilic temple of Ezra and Nehemiah. Of course, we're told by Yekeskel that it will return to the new Mikdash that will be built for Mashiach. <clears throat> but today, there is no Mishkan, no Hamikdash. So, where does God dwell? Well, <clears throat> God is everywhere, as he has always been. He's omnipresent. But when you received Mashiach Yeshua's atoning sacrifice as your Kippur for sin, God's Ruach, his breath, his spirit, was breathed into you and you became spiritually alive for the first time, filled with his presence. Is there room for anyone else if God fills you? We're told that God inhabits the very praises and worship of his people. How much more so when two or more are gathered in his name, is he there among us? His presence is transcendent, but perceptible. It is a reality. What is he hearing and seeing when he is among us? How do we express our joy at his presence. Is he pleased with our worship? Does it truly come from our hearts? Melek David tells us that he yearned for the courts of Adonai even before the building of the great Mikdash. What does that really mean to, to yearn to yearn for the residence of habitation of God. Well, yearn is not a word that we use very commonly, but it means to have a deep and abiding desire for something that promises joy and delight. One who yearns for the courts of God longs to be in God's presence, hungers to experience real communion with God, fellowship with God, to enjoy the companionship of God, and has as his hope, his wish, and greatest desire, 
the goal of closeness and companionship with God with which nothing else can compare. So I ask you this question. Does your whole being rejoice in God's presence, especially taking pleasure in being with those who also enjoy his presence? Because where two or more are gathered in, in his name, we see the presence of God multiplied. Is that possible? Yes. Enjoying his presence together makes great sense. But do you long for a time when you will be with him constantly and eternally? Do you crave close relationship with him and particularly enjoy times alone with him? Are you eager to be near him? taking real pleasure in times such as this, when we are gathered as a community in his name. At this season, we consider the way of Aliyah. Our Aliyah festivals were first of all commanded by God. God told us as a nation and a people that three times each year, at the very least, the head of each household must appear before him at the place he designated. Even those actually living in the land might find this difficult, a difficult task, yet it was considered a special privilege to be able to go up to Jerusalem at Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Perhaps we now take these events, these holy days, for granted. But God does not. The pilgrimage to Jerusalem was about walking the walk, acting out one's faith. And that is still true today. Have you ever gone on a holiday which you planned far in advance, carefully calculating all the necessary elements of preparation in order to be sure that you had considered every little detail. I'm sure all of us have had at least one holiday like that. I remember my, my first trip to Israel in 1982. We planned this trip more than six months in advance and <clears throat> calculated everything we possibly could to make sure that it would be the special event that we had hoped for. And it was. Those making the journey to Jerusalem for one of these holy days had quite a lot of preparation to make because they had to clear away many obstacles in order to be enabled to go on what was in those days a lengthy and difficult journey, not just a matter of getting in a car and driving for a, a time or taking a bus or train. Think of all the preparations that had to be made for this Aliyah. Well, if you were a farmer, which most of us were, you had to provide someone to care for your animals and your crops to prepare food and water, clothing, and even shelter for the journey, which might include your entire family, from Bubba and Zeta to the babies. 
the Pilgrim High Roads had separate stopping places, which would accommodate approximately a day's travel. These were constantly in our minds as the journey was planned. We looked forward to reaching the next awaited goal, where we would join with others longing to be in God's presence and relishing the opportunity to be together again. Perhaps we managed to make this journey several times in our lifetime, and we looked forward to seeing people we hadn't seen for a long time. Reaching Jerusalem, well, this of course was the goal of our longing, always before us. As we walked and talked with one another and sang the songs of ascent, and despite every diversion, distraction, or difficulty, those who'd gone before, who had experience, must have delighted in telling those who'd never been what was in store for them, how Jerusalem would first appear above them as they walked, the sights, the sounds, and the smells of the holy city, and finally, the wonder of the abode of God, with Kohanim coming and going, sacrifices being made, worshipers preparing themselves in the many mikvot that surrounded the temple. At Sukkot, there would be a crowd of Sukkot being built and readied around the temple square with cut branches of trees everywhere being applied to roofs. The excitement must have been incredible. Children and adults bubbling over with the thrill of this holiday. And we would talk about the harvest. Was it the best in years? A little below last year's. We all look forward to the coming rains for the year ahead. The path and experience of the pilgrim, that is the way we are commanded to live our lives here on earth. One who is a pilgrim will not be satisfied unless and until he can reach the goal of his desire. Traveling the Pilgrim Highway means that one is always going onward, always going up, always looking forward to the heavenly city from which the glory of God's presence radiates. We're not journeying alone. We're together, rejoicing in the presence of others who have the same excitement and anticipation, the same goal. Like Avraham, the father of all spiritual pilgrims, who we are told lived as a temporary resident in the land of promise, as if it were not his, staying in tents with Yitzchak and Yaakov, who were to receive what was prom promised along with him, for he was looking forward to the city with permanent foundations of which the architect and builder is God. Avraham, of course, lived before the time when Jerusalem was our city, but he looked forward. He looked forward to what God had promised. Now, the Valley of Baca is part of the Aliyah experience. The Midbar years, of which we read at length in the Torah, were not necessarily 
either pleasant or enjoyable. But despite our disobedience and rebellion, God cared for us, never allowing our shoes or our clothing to wear out, providing food and for all of our needs. All but Kalev, not descended from Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, but a Jew by choice, and Yahashua, the only one of that generation, all of them died in the wilderness. But during the time of their lives, they, God was always with them. For Kalev and Yahashua, the sojourn in the wilderness was but a prelude to the land of promise, where they would inherit. Incidentally, we know that Kalev's younger brother, Othniel, who of course was under 20 at the time of the scouts, was among us too, and he eventually became a judge in Israel. <clears throat> the wilderness experience was often a valley of weeping. Baca has been taken to mean weeping or sorrow. The valley of weeping was long thought by many scholars to be a, a state of being, one of difficulty and struggle, rather than a literal place. However, it now seems likely that Baca represents a stopping point, perhaps the last stopping place for those journeying from northern Israel on the eastern side of the Yarden. It is a narrow and gloomy valley where a black stream of water flowed out of rocks in which graves for those who died along the way had been dug. It might be seen as a valley of despair. For the pilgrims journeying up to Jerusalem, that gloomy, tear-filled present, where some might even lose sight of the city of light up ahead, a place of suffering or pain or sorrow, could become something quite different. <coughs> Pardon me. God showed us that the Valley of Weeping can become a place of springs, of life. The pilgrim's joyous hope and the infinite beauty of the goal ahead was worth any amount of trouble, pain, or sorrow. The place of weeping, seen in the light of anticipation, now afforded the pilgrim's comfort, refreshment, and restoration and the stream of water, it was there to cool their weary feet and satisfy their thirst. The Valley of Bacha, of weeping, can become, as one of our songs suggests, a Valley of Bracha, of blessing. The power of God, which after nearly 2,000 years has brought our people back to the land of our father, Israel, also brings the wandering prodigal back to the side of his God and draws each of us, however far we have strayed, to the place of God's presence. Once there, God promises that he will heal our backsliding, that he will love us freely and without expectation, that is, unconditionally, and we will dwell under the shadow of his wings, protected, revived, and renewed, energized. The way of the pilgrim, the way of Aliyah, is the way of our God. Hashem declares through the prophets that his ways are good 
for us. Perfect, complete, right, as well as righteous. We're told that the just, the righteous, Sadakim, shall walk in the ways of the eternal, and transgressors will fall because they do not fear God and they have rejected his ways. To Helim 119, from which we have read this morning as we turned the Torah, was a series of songs sung by those making Aliyah to Yerushalayim. It is an acrostic and is the most um, elaborate of the uh, alphabetical psalms. Similar acrostics are found in Mishle 31 and Elka 1 through 4. This psalm is divided into 22 sections corresponding to the 22 letters of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. The eight verses of each section begin with the same letter in the proper sequence of the Aleph Bet as designated at the head of each section. Perhaps you wondered about that. Sections of the psalm were sung at specific places in the journey upward or between specific stations along the way. The songs were an encouragement to pilgrims as they went up to Jerusalem, reminding them of the purpose of their commitment to Aliyah. And one of the reasons we refer to being called to the, to the Bema to read from the Torah as an Aliyah. The psalm was written in praise of God's instructions, his holy word given through Moshe and the prophets to the people of Israel. It defines the relationship between each individual and God, the way of God's commandments, instructions, and laws. It sets forth the desirability of faithfulness to God as seen in faithfulness to his commandments. In every verse of the entire 176 ascent verses 122, we find, except for verse 122, we find some reference to the specific commands. These are not suggestions given by Hashem. They're not generalities. They're specifics that concern every area of our lives, our actions, our attitudes, our thoughts, our hopes, and our desires. These commandments are not merely the content of a song, but must become a real part of our lives, our pilgrimage. According to Rav Yeshua, pilgrims are different from those around them. Why are they different? because they are aware of their spiritual poverty, their own personal inadequacy, and then, thus they come to God in humility, recognizing their spiritual bankruptcy and seeking to return to God to do Teshuva. Rav Yeshua, like the prophet Yoel, tells us to rend our hearts and not our garments, as a sign of repentance and mourning, to mourn our own sinfulness and the wrongs we see in the world, to sorrow and cry out for the spiritual plight, not only of our people, but of ourselves. Rav Yeshua calls us to hunger and thirst after righteousness to have an insatiable appetite for what is right and what is holy, to eagerly long to walk with God and to do everything to please him. 
He reminds us of God's calling upon our people. We are to be set apart, sanctified, dedicated solely for God's purposes, holy unto Hashem. Pilgrims walk in accordance with Hashem's express commandments given in his Torah, confirmed by Rav Yeshua. Pilgrims follow his path, and they seek his ways, along with others, with the same purpose and goals. As we rejoice in receiving the Torah, the Holy Scriptures, and the Torah made flesh, we are reminded not only to hear his word, but to act upon it. Our Aliyah is the process of actively seeking to do the will of Hashem. May that be your desire and mine. Shalom.